everybody, it's Joe Pryor from the Ladies Working Dog Group. Are you feeling stuck with your gun dog training? Trust me, you're not alone and that's exactly why you need to be here. Every week, we'll bring you the best tips and hacks to make training your gun dog easy peasy. We'll keep it straightforward, no fuss, just actionable guidance that you can put straight to use. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of Found It, Fetched It. This week, we're going to be talking all about the importance about being your own competition, how you can reach your gun dog goals by making sure that you work with just the dog in front of you. Join me for this week's episode are the amazing LWDG group experts, Claire Denya and Gemma Martin. How are we both today? Yeah, very well. Thank you, Joe. Lovely to be here for another podcast. Yeah, cracking. Thanks, Joe. How are you? I'm looking forward to this podcast, Gem, because... This was your idea based on something that happened to you this weekend? So I entered Yara in her first working test this weekend and there were no spaces in the novice, no runs available. So I rightly or wrongly entered her in the open because I wanted her to have a run before the end of the test season. But I went into it setting my own goals. So I wasn't going into it as competition for the others. I knew we wouldn't place or award because she's not an open dog bless her but I went in setting my own goals that I wanted to achieve and for me that was just her to hunt nice and close in a new environment and the environment was full of deers and all sorts of other smells and she achieved that and more so for me it was a win and that's what I mean about being your own competition set what your own achievements are going to be don't judge yourself against other people's standards. I think we're all quite prone to this though aren't we where we set ourselves goals that aren't small incremental steps or specific like you just pointed out Gem but they're more a case of wanting to have this shall we say perfect fully trained gun dog as fast as we can do you see that a lot Claire? Absolutely this is a conversation that comes up a lot and I think it's very easy when you are training a dog to look at what other people are doing around you with their dogs. And because the dog is a similar breed or a similar age, people start to sort of pitch their own goals and expectations around what other people are achieving instead of just staying focused on what do I want to achieve and what sort of capability did my dog and I have together that we can expand and grow on? And I think when you start forgetting about yourself and your dog as a team and watching too much what other people are doing and being too fixated on how other people are getting on, it can really, one, destroy your confidence, but also take the fun out of the training as well. Yeah, I love what you did there in that event. In you looked at something really specific, didn't you? You didn't even go in there and say, "Oh, oh okay, there's twenty of us running. I want to be in the top 15. or something." There was like a broad spectrum goal. You were very like specific in your intention. Yeah, exactly. I wanted her to have an achievable goal, and I wanted me to have an achievable goal because I know if I went out there and said, "I want to be in the," top sort of half of the the points group then it was going to be unrealistic she's never been in that sort of environment with lots of different people around she's never been in that environment with those sort of scents and the fact that she hunted closely and did the retrieves which I didn't think she would do is a massive win so I think it's important to set realistic goals for your dogs and then if you succeed and exceed them then it's a bonus I can remember my dad always telling us when we were like competing with the horses, like it was like just have fun, do your 12 fun. I don't think he was as easy with his own goals. So if we were in an event where he could compete and I could compete, he wasn't that sort of kind to himself. And I think that's something we all do as well. We all try to help others by saying, look, just have fun with this. And then on another side of that, we're like, I must win we give ourselves like completely different goals but also I think that if you keep things quite not easy breezy but small and specific you've got far more chance of achieving them would you agree with that Claire? Yeah definitely I think 
when you look at training a dog and achieving things like gems achieved by by meeting those goals and actually exceeding her own goals for that test She's done that by setting realistic expectations of the day. Like Jem said, she didn't go in there going, I want to be in the top 10 in the scoreboard. She said, I just want my dog to hunt close and to achieve these little things because that's a big win. I think very often in training, we can forget or handlers can forget that we have to layer up that training step by step, little piece by little piece, taking those three Ds into consideration with everything that we're training and developing the dog for. And very often when you go to a training day or a working test, all of that's gone out of the window because you don't know till you get there what you're going to be doing. And so you're thrown into the cauldron, so to speak, of this is what you're doing today. And maybe your dog's not quite there. So it's really good to know where you're at with your dog and what you're trying to achieve with your dog and take baby steps to get there. And then you're not going to feel deflated or feel like you haven't achieved something good. And that's really important because we see this on the membership a lot. People have doubt, bad days training with their dog, which happens, but it's a bad day. It doesn't mean it's a bad year. So if you have those baby steps, you think it's easier to get back on the saddle and carry on than it is to go, oh, no, it's all gone wrong. This has put me back six months. No, it hasn't put you back six months. Jem? Yeah, and I think to add to that, because we had Yara out when I was down with you a couple of weeks ago. And I openly admitted to Claire that we hadn't done a lot of blind retrieves or anything. And I knew that she'd have to do some probably more challenging blinds in this test. But some of the ones that she did at yours were absolutely awful, weren't they? <laughs> Let's be honest about it. She didn't go the direction I sent her. She didn't go the distance we needed. But by breaking all those little bits down and not dwelling on the fact that she can't do the end result yet, she actually pulled it out of the bag on the day because I'd taken those steps back and built her really slowly over the last couple of weeks, doing really easy and building on that. So not letting it get to you and think, oh, no, my dog can't do it and setting them up for success, which is what we always say. Claire? I think that's really important. And yes, we did do that. And I think that was really nice. And this is where having that community around us, supporting each other is so important and useful. And yeah, you did bring her down and you were like, she doesn't often train with other dogs. So that was one hurdle. She hasn't done lots of blind retrieves. So we set some scenarios to see where she was at so that you were able to go away for a couple of weeks and work on those specific things, knowing what you needed to work on. So I thought that was really cool. So I think I was nearly as chuffed for Yara as you were when I found out how well she did at the working test and because that's the thing we want to cheer each other on and that in the community and us as trainers together we want to cheer each other on. I also think that you touched upon something there as well though is that you had a go even though you knew it wasn't completely right if she hadn't done the retrieves you knew that wasn't perfect so it wasn't one of your goals that like you didn't go, oh, but that should have been right as well. You just stayed on your specific goal, didn't you? Yeah, definitely. And I, I genuinely fully didn't expect her to go the distance for the blinds. I also, they threw in on the day that they had to ignore the marked and go for the blind. So I hadn't trained for that at all. But again, I'd built in steadiness and listening skills. So I had to rely on those and luckily they worked. But yeah, I fully expected to get zeros for my retrieves and just accept that she'd done the bit I wanted her to do really well and cope with the environment. So, yeah. I love your confidence on this as well, though, because a lot of people, they wouldn't do it unless the dog was perfect. But the dog needs to be in that environment to actually train itself for that environment. We get caught in this sort of couch 22 when you're like, okay, how can I replicate a training 
day that's like a trialing day you can a little bit but you can't completely can you no not at all because my nerves were always going to be there as well which she hasn't experienced before and that was a massive factor for her because she was like suddenly why is mum so worried about this and there were a few times that I just had to drop the lead and have a bit of distance from her because I was affecting her and I think it's recognizing that in yourself as well and going look I'm affecting my dog she's a bit confused and giving both of you a little bit of slack but yeah Realistic goals are the most important thing. Claire? I'm going to try and take some inspiration from that, Gem, because my nerves are dreadful <laughs> at working tests. And uh, I'm going to try and take a little bit of a leaf out of your book on that, actually. And I like the fact that you recognise that your nerves were a thing and you dropped the lead and gave the dog a bit of space. And I think that's something I can take from your experience there because... I don't think I've ever tried that before. So I'm like, mental note of that one. I haven't tried that. Maybe that will help me. So I think that's really good. One thing we do really well in our group is set intentions for people. Because when you're new, you don't know what you don't know. So therefore, it can be hard to set the correct goals or the correct intentions because you don't really know what they look like. It's a little bit like, trying to make a meal and not knowing what the end product should look should look like but just having ingredients so one of the things we've done is put together levels and I think our ladies love this everyone has access to our checklist but just to go through I've pulled up on my screen the checklist for foundation level and things like walk your dog on a loose lead at least eight steps away from the camera turn and walk at least eight steps back towards the camera for loose lead walking Things for recall, 16 steps away, recall your dog. Sit and wait, leave your dog and sit, walk two semicircles. These are like tiny goals compared to what most people set themselves, which is I want a loose lead walk for 10 minutes whilst going through the middle of town centre. And I think people need to work on setting achievable amounts for their dogs, don't they? Yeah, definitely. And we see this all the time and um, people will come to class and they'll start doing really well with their loose lead walking um, and nailing all the exercises we do in class. And then they'll say, oh, but when I take them here, they're freaking awful. They pull, they do this, they do that. But that's because they haven't taken into account everything that's going on. So the three D's that we talk about a lot, which is the distraction, the duration and the distance, they've skipped all the gaps between doing that little bit in in class and then expecting the dog to do it in a field that's just had loads of pheasants running around in it so it's really important we build those bricks up really slowly and have little goals on the way so it's, i've done my eight steps to and from camera next week i'm going to do a whole minute of walking figures of eight around the field or whatever but you've got to have those little milestones that you can reach so that you can build rather than going, I've done my eight steps right now. I'm going to go for an hour's walk and expect my dog to not pull the whole time. Yeah, exactly that. And I think one of the nicest things for me when we put these levels with the certificates in place and those checklists that kind of go with that, one of the things I've really enjoyed is seeing people grow through following that process and achieve their foundation level and then their novice level and then their intermediate and now we've obviously got the advanced level and so it's just been lovely to see the handlers and their dogs be able to go from that foundation step and gradually follow a process to get to a point where they can do more advanced things and I think the community shares that success with each other and that makes it very special. And I just think too often, when we did the podcast, was it called The Age Race, the podcast that we did? That was a really popular podcast. And I think it was popular because it took pressure off of people. And it's the same with our levels through the certificates, with those checklists. We're taking pressure off of people to have to go from A to Z. We're saying go from A to B and then from B to C and so on and so we're giving people achievable goals if they struggle to think in their own head how to put those achievable steps in place ladies i want to ask you have you ever compared your training journey to someone else's and felt discouraged yeah i think every day <laughs> i think because we're surrounded by like social media of watching other people 
do stuff with their dogs oh mate I really should have tried a bit harder and been at that level with my dog and I should have done this and why haven't I done that but I think then you've got to take a step back and go most people only put the really best bits on social media you're not seeing all the days that they've been out and sent their dog for a blind and it's gone completely the other way or they've blown a stop whistle and it's actually <laughs> carried on running down a field you just don't see those bits and I think it's really important to remember when you're seeing all these wonderful dogs doing wonderful things on social media that actually there's a lot of failures and a lot of not so great bits that have gone gone on within that before they've got to that stage just be a bit kind to yourself and run your own race and like I say be your own competition so you're only competing against yourself everyone's journey is really different Claire I couldn't agree more. I think social media has a massive thing to do with it. But I think, I'm not sure if ego is the right word or not. It might or might not be. But I agree, Jen. A lot of people will only show their good stuff. And when I first started documenting Rosie's journey from eight weeks of age, I got quite a lot of criticism from other trainers on social media who don't even know me in person for sharing warts and all. And I thought, no, no, do you know what? I think it's important to show what can go wrong, how you might rectify it, and what that looks like in real life, not just writing it down. In real life, what does that look like? But then also, what does it look like when you move through that process and you get the light at the end of the tunnel? And for the criticism that I received, what I've received as positive feedback from real people with real dogs thanking me for sharing that information far outweighed the little bit of negativity that I felt for being criticised for sharing it. And it actually boosted my confidence in sharing that so that other people could be realistic. Because that's the thing. Just because I'm a trainer doesn't mean my dog isn't a dog my dog doesn't become a robot just because I'm a trainer <laughs> and I'm a human being who makes mistakes and my dog is an animal that equally makes mistakes and as a pair we will achieve things and we will make mistakes as a pair so I think the more honest trainers can be about that with their clients I think that clients and handlers will have more confidence that they can achieve things and will have trust in the process of getting there because they can see that it did go wrong for us too. There's a diagram uh, that I've shared before and it's, it looks like a little bit of a roller coaster. That's the reality of training a dog. It's not an uphill climb of Everest with no dips. It is more like a roller coaster. I didn't explain that brilliantly, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really nice. I think you almost paved the way for some people to feel confident in showing their like bits that haven't gone quite as right. I know that Tom Cantwell shares quite a lot of bloopers on Facebook, doesn't he? And I think they make you really relatable as a trainer because it's not always perfect. And sometimes the dogs do have you pulling your hair out and going, oh, my God. But yeah, I think it's really important to, to realise that dogs aren't robots and it does go wrong. And those mistakes are what make learning happen sometimes. There's a girl I follow on Instagram. I don't even know how I follow her. I think I started following her during COVID and she skips, but she like skips the music. It's really like cool. And she shows the progress. But now her reels are about maybe three or four minutes long. So they're quite a long reel, like not a seven second job. You have it all going great. And she shows everything, like how many times she trips over the skipping rope, when she's learning new moves, where she can't get the new moves, all this stuff. And I literally watched the whole thing. I'm totally fascinated. And I think you're both quite right. Watching her get it wrong for three and a half minutes before I see the 30 seconds where she gets it right, those three and a half minutes builds my confidence to have a go at it. Am I out skipping to music? No, I'm not. But I feel better about the entire process. And I think that it's that sort of behaviour from us that helps other people to get really confident to take little steps. It's a bit like me on these podcasts and on our live Q&As, isn't it? I quite randomly make up words from time to time, but nobody minds. <laughs> if I want 
wanted to be perfect at doing podcasts, how would I ever achieve that? Because I don't always get the language right or come up with the right word straight away. But then that's your personality, isn't it? So when sometimes when you make mistakes or just showing actually genuinely who you are does definitely make you more relatable and makes other people see what can be achieved because I always thought I was really good at English at school but since doing podcasts I've decided I clearly made a lot of stuff up as I went along <laughs> yeah Cass, like like we laugh and joke and, and a lot of like bloopers are taken out of this in the fact that sometimes we completely lose our way and we're like what on God's earth am I on about now? And we like laugh and joke about it, which is fab. But I think that's just normal behaviour, isn't it? If I'm having a talk to you in my kitchen over a cup of tea, I lose my train of thought. And I'm like, what were we on about? Where were we going with that? And we need to be brought back. But again, it's this whole thing of not expecting anything to be completely perfect. Because nothing in life ever is. 100% I agree nothing in life is perfect and we do our very best and I just think when you look at our community it's very different to a lot of the other gun dog communities where people think that their opinion is the right opinion and we will give lots and lots of advice on lots of different ways you might want to do something with a dog depending on the dog rather than oh how dare you do that that's not how you do that and I think that's what makes the community we have so unique is that we're sharing knowledge that we know works. We also share things that go wrong to help other people understand how to overcome those things, but also so that they feel like it's okay when it goes wrong. But it's not a dictatorship. And I think that you see this a lot in the gun dog world, like a real dictatorship. Of, this is how you must train this. And it's like, no, there's a thousand ways of training this, depending on the dog and the handler. And I just think with those baby steps, Not only is there baby steps to get there, but there's also lots and lots of ways in that baby step to achieve it because one method might not work for you. So you might have to try something else. So it's not even just about taking baby steps. It's taking baby steps that work for you, not trying to pigeonhole yourself into doing something some way that it doesn't feel right and doesn't work for you and the dog. And I think you see this a lot. People say, my trainer said, I must do this, but they can't. And maybe they can't physically or maybe they can't mentally, but it's about, okay, let's find a way that works for you. And that has to be part of that growing process as well. Incredibly hard again, though, to encourage people to track their progress with their dog. So we encourage the use of the journal or filming yourself or using the checklist, or doing something to help the person reflect on how far they can. So I think then what happens is you are your own competition, but in a kind and positive way. It's about making sure that you are improving, not beating yourself up. And Gem, do you see that in our ladies? They tend to, the more time they spend with us, tend to be far more lenient when they make mistakes yeah definitely and I think they share their journeys with everyone else and they get support from everyone else and everyone says oh yeah I was there last month or last year or whatever and actually I think sharing all of your stages on the group with your videos and your achievements or your little wins are really nice because in a year's time they pop up as a memory and go oh do you remember that that was me last year and I've done this year so look how far we've come and I think We forget to look back and go, oh, look where I started. So, yeah, I think one, the group for the support and the memories is really good. Two, the the goal setting and you've given them the journals to write down and track their progress is really good. And, yeah, I think it's invaluable to people. To continue our conversation around this, if there was a piece of advice you could give to someone just starting the the entire gun dog training journey not going to like a trial or anything but just got a brand new little puppy with them what would it be for you guys i think i'd probably say first step get to know your dog and build a bond and a relationship with that dog that's got to be the grounding for everything else that you do is building that relationship understanding how that puppy or dog ticks and what motivates them and get that relationship going and let them enjoy 
that bonding process time with you. I think people can get too serious too quickly with a puppy gun dog because they see all the more advanced stuff and so they can get serious too quickly. So let the puppy develop as you're teaching it. And, and of course, some of the training will feel serious because if you're teaching them to walk on a loose lead or teaching them a six day, but that doesn't mean it still can't be fun and, and play based. And then from there, I think either finding a community of like minded people that sing from the same song sheet as you and have the same beliefs of you can be very useful. And also finding a trainer if you want to find a trainer who, again, sings from the song same song sheet as you has the same sort of belief in training as you and someone that you can gel with and bond with and just enjoy that process with those baby steps and try not to put too much pressure on yourself that's how I would start Gem yeah definitely enjoy the puppy stage because it doesn't last as long as you think it lasts and it's soon gone enjoy that bonding enjoy those sort of foundational skills that you're setting for your dogs in a fun way and I think ultimately, in the first year, think, where do we want to be at the end of this year? What do I want from my dog? Is it just a pet that I want to take on walks and have good general obedience out of? And then setting realistic milestones in that journey that are relevant to you and your dog. So how much time can you put into training every week? And is that a realistic goal to set? And it might be that when you get to a year old with your dog, that your goal changes because you've aced your first year and you've excelled all, all your points that you set. So your goal changes to maybe I am going to do tests with my dog. Uh, and then next year it might excel that and you go, actually, I'm going to try on my dog. Your goals can change, but make sure that you're aiming for something realistic to start with. You hit on something there that I want to just talk a little bit about before we close this episode down, which is time spent training because when we talk about our dogs and obviously they live in creatures they need our care all day every day but they don't need us to train them all day every day do they no it's really important that when you bring that puppy into your home of course they need all their needs met that's a given but they also need a lot of time of rest and sleep and you need to find a way of fitting what the puppy needs into your lifestyle so that you don't fall into the trap of the puppy starting to become almost the dictatorship to how your life is, because ultimately that can't continue. No one can continue. You would probably get, I think it's called the puppy blues. I've read about this in stuff, the puppy blues, where people get so far into the journey with their puppy and it's become completely overwhelming and all consuming and they actually feel sad and desperate and broken by this puppy coming into their lives because they haven't thought about how to fit the puppy into the life that they need it to fit into. And like I said before, they you still need to ensure that puppy's needs are all met. But when you think that a puppy should be sleeping for around 18 hours a day, okay because they're growing they're developing so if you think about it like that 18 hours hours out of 24 there's no reason that you should be feeling run ragged by a routine that this puppy is dictating to you so I think sometimes you just need to take that step back and be like okay is my puppy getting its needs met and is it getting the sleep that it requires and how do I fit this into the lifestyle that I can comfortably work through? Yeah, definitely. And I think every person's going to be different. And as long as the, like you say, the needs are met, that puppy really has to start fitting into your sort of daily life. And if it doesn't, you one begin to resent the puppy because it's come in and suddenly your life res revolves around this puppy. And then you don't want to spend time with it as much because it's it's this big tie uh, but equally that dog's got to fit into your life moving forward and you don't want to be getting up at three times a night for the rest of your life and making sure it has its dinner at bang on six o'clock because otherwise the world ends or if you don't get up on time it's going to howl the house down all of those things so we need to make sure that the puppies are adapting to us as well as we're making sure we're meeting all of those needs and if it means 
that your puppy doesn't go out one day, the world is not going to end. You can train your puppy to deal with things like that and chill out in the house and cope and build those skills into your dog. So don't be too rigid with your training going, oh my God, I haven't been out twice today to make it do an hour's heel work or three hours retrieving or whatever. Yeah, you just said something really important there, Gem. The puppy doesn't need to have every day it several training sessions thrown at it every single day that can just be overwhelming for a puppy and one of the things I say to people all the time and it's just so important to remember a tired puppy is a grouchy puppy (laughs) so when people start talking about puppy mouthing puppy biting the puppy having what they call is it witching hour or something like that where I think it's that (laughs) something like that where they just seem out of control so often those puppies are tired they're doing too much and so this is where the owners aren't thinking about the sleep required the rest required the downtime required so it is super super important to remember that I think as well when we add on to that the fact that if we look at conversations where people say always training yes you are always training but I don't think you're actually always training I think you are training for a set amount of time per day but you're always supporting the boundaries and I'm sure this is like a podcast in itself so you don't need to be constantly engaging them in stuff but you do need to be really sure you're not letting them slip back is that making sense yeah that makes perfect sense I think where you were going with that was that Part of your puppy's learning is your puppy learning that they have to sometimes do nothing. And that means you doing nothing with the puppy. (laughs) And I think sometimes people get that a little bit confused and the puppy is settling and they'll go over and say, oh, well done, good puppy for settling and give them a treat and wake them up again. And they're all of a sudden over aroused again. It's Oh, no, it's broken that now. So yeah, absolutely that, Joan. You are training your dog with every interaction, whether you're interacting with it or not. I don't think I've ever said it that way before. There was a first time for that. Okay, to round up another fantastic episode, I want to just finish with this question to go back to this sort of be in your own competition. What are the two things people can do at the end of listening to this episode, I ask one from you, Claire, one from you, Gem, that they can do just keep this in mind all the time about be in your own competition. How do you guys make sure you keep that at the forefront of your mind? For me, to not get hung up on what everyone else is doing, focus on my dog. What I try and do is just look at our little wins every day. Did we achieve today what we set out to achieve today? Just for us, that's it. Gem? Exactly that. Achievable little milestones. And even if you set out one day and say, I'm going to do this and you don't fully achieve it, think, okay, so we didn't quite get there, but tomorrow we probably will because I'm going to break it down and help the dog succeed. But I don't care about what everyone else is doing. It's me and my dog on our journey and we're going to share our journey with everyone else. Yeah, I love both of those. And like sometimes when I'm putting up reels and stuff on Instagram, I'm like, oh my God, it sounds so cheesy. They're like, celebrate your wins. I I feel like a Hallmark card um, in a birthday shop. But that is the truth about it. There is no other way I can really say to people, like, be proud of every little bit because with a dog, you are basically winning all the time in everything to do with them, getting their attention, getting a bond built, all those things. They sound like little things, but they're actually such a big thing, aren't they? They're big things to make sure that you have a journey. That's another one of those words I feel like I, I see written everywhere, you and your dog training journey. But they're like, it is a journey, a step by step. You are always winning. You are always moving forward. You are always reaffirming the boundaries. It, they are. It's a constant thing. If my dog's tail is wagging at the end of a training session, I've achieved something good. <laughs> But thank you both for another amazing episode. I hope that everybody listening has enjoyed. If you go to www.ladiesworkingdoggroup.com forward slash freebies, that's forward slash freebies, we will send you one email with a load of freebies on there to help you 
with loads of stuff that we've talked about today that includes things like things to help you plan things to help you set goals and intentions things to help you going out for a trial for the day or going to the beach for the day. There's loads of things in there to help you. Make sure you get your hands on that because it will be something that you will find incredibly helpful on your dog training journey. Please review, please subscribe, and we look forward to speaking to you all next week. That's it for today's episode. A massive thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to head over to the LWDG and sign up for our membership. Get access to expert-led training, a wonderfully supportive community and the resources you need to become a confident and skilled gun dog trainer. Let's take this journey together because no woman should have to train her gun dog alone. We'll see you all next week.